open back up to Ephesians 2. We're in the book of Ephesians, which is the, the biggest theme of Ephesians is grace. And if you want to get to a place where grace abounds in Scripture, uh, Ephesians is it. And the first three chapters especially um, are, the, are the treatise on grace and how grace uh, applies after the fact of how uh, of knowing how holy God is, how much God hates sin, how, how, how great grace is in light of God's holiness, and it helps us appreciate grace so much more. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 22, we'll reread that. Starting verse 11, says, Therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were once afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place, of God in the spirit. A duck hunter was with a friend in a wide open land of southeastern Georgia. Far away on the horizon, he noticed a cloud of smoke. Soon he could hear the crackling as the wind shifted. He realized the horrible truth of brush fire was advancing and so fast that they wouldn't be able to outrun it. Rifling through his pockets, he found what he was looking for, a simple book of matches. He lit a small fire around the two of them. Soon they were standing in the circle of blackened earth, waiting for the fire to come. They didn't have to wait long. They covered their mouths with handkerchiefs and braced themselves. The fire came near and swept over them, but they were completely unhurt, untouched. The fire would not pa pass where fire already had passed. The law is like that. The law is like a brush fire. I cannot escape it, but if I stand in a burned over place, not a hair on my head will be singed. Christ's death has disarmed it. I like that illustration a lot. Reminds us how the law is this torrential uh, system of righteousness that is the only way that we can be saved. And technically it's true. You can only be saved if there was a lamb that was slain at the temple for your sin. But because of Christ's sacrifice, the, the law and all its ferocity and the law and all of its rules and regulation and, and consequences for not abiding by the law, the law itself cannot harm you because we stand in a place that's protected within our faith in Christ Jesus. And so this uh, section of Ephesians, Paul's writing about how holy God is. And how God gave us something very special in the law itself. I think we tend to forget that the law is quite beautiful in its own right. The law, the first five books of the Bible, the 700 commandments that you have to follow in order to be right with God. We, as God who is perfectly holy and man is, is a wretched sinner. For God to even extend us the olive branch of the law in itself is a beautiful act of grace. That you, that you could, if you followed the, the Jewish law, the Mosaic law, uh, 
could have a relationship with God and can worship God, who is so holy he can't look upon sin. But the law is like this filter that is used to uh, to purify ourselves so we can get through to a place where we can worship God. And that alone is a great thing. And we should praise God for what he's done. But then as this passage says, we're brought near by the blood of Christ and Christ being our peace. The law that is very important and, and very significant and quite beautiful itself held out at arm's length those who were not following the law. It's, it uses the word enmity. Uh, you see that there in, um, in verse... In verse 16, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, so that Gentiles and, and Jews, who one group was uh, in God's favor, the other group was at enmity with God, through the law, and then of course through the fulfillment of the law, which is the cross, can be made and brought together, so that Jesus is our peace so that you and I can know God in a real relationship with him, even though there is this thing called the law that is barreling down on us that we have to abide by. And I, I think that, uh, that we often mistake the law for something that is very barbaric and very, uh, very uncomfortable. You know, I could never live under the, the provisions of the law. But the law in itself is something that allows Jews, that allows people to come to God. And so in that sense, it's a very good and very beautiful thing. But then when Christ came, as we talked about a little bit in Sunday school, Christ didn't abolish the law. He didn't get rid of the law. He fulfilled the law. So God's plan to, to get Gentiles saved uses the parameters of that very law. When I was in, uh, in Israel, uh, go ahead to the next slide, Grant, I saw this symbol, uh, it was everywhere, and there's, in Jerusalem, there's a uh, Christian quarter, and there's the, uh, the, the Muslim quarter, and there's the, the Jewish quarter, but in the Christian quarter, this symbol was, was celebrated everywhere, and uh, they, don't, they, they don't use the cross as a symbol uh, very much in Israel because it reminds people a lot of the Crusades and they have a, 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 an Eastern Orthodox cross which is a little bit different. But the, the most predominant symbol of Christianity is the fish. And this symbol has the, uh, the fish in it and it shows that, that Christianity is grafted in to uh, Israel. And, and Christians are grafted into the tree of Israel. And really essentially we tend to think of Judaism and Christianity as separate religions, but according to Scripture and according to God's plan, it's one uh, one lengthened philosophy or one lengthened religion, you could say. The law is the basis to for which Christ eventually came and, and died to fulfill the law. Christ being the lamb that was slain. So the law is not necessarily something that is... Uh, simple, uh, simply something that's dismissed, it's still very significant. But in God's timing, we are uh, meet the requirements of the law through the cross and through Christ. In Romans 7, Paul likens this to, uh, to a marriage. And he says that, that a person that is, that is married is, is bound, uh, the wife is bound to her husband for as long as that husband is alive. But if that husband dies, she's free to remarry. What happened to the law? What happened to the vows that she took? Well, he's gone. They're no longer relevant. But it doesn't make those vows and that marriage less significant, does it? It's still a very significant part of her past and very significant uh, vow that she took, that God took that vow very seriously. But she's no longer bound to obey those vows because her husband's gone. It's kind of like that with the cross. The law is very significant. The Old Testament scriptures are very significant and very special. And they, the law reveals things about the heart of God. The law shows us how much, how, or how holy God is, how much God hates sin. That's very important to remember. The law, the foundation of the, 
uh, of the Old Testament of the Bible is still very significant, but we're just no longer bound by its rules. It's still important for us to know. It's still important for us to remember. It's still important for us to reference. I mean, how often have you looked at the Ten Commandments and thought, these are great rules for mankind. They're still very important laws, but we're not bound by the weight of them. You can eat shellfish. You can eat bacon and still be right with God. But in from the very beginning of, uh, of God working in humanity, it started with Abraham, moved on to his, his family, his line, and eventually the uh, all of the Hebrews that, that Moses led, and then we got the law from them. But we're still very much a part of the same philosophy, the same line of, of, of thinking, the same line of, uh, of reasoning, in, except for the fact that in the cross, we have the Lamb of God slain, so essentially we're still obeying the law because there was a Lamb that was slain that's for our benefit. Does that make sense? Our sins were upon the Lamb. His righteousness is upon us. So it's still fulfilling the law, but not necessarily being held by all the rules of the law. And that's what Paul is saying here. He says that one time the law kept people apart. There was enmity between the two groups, uh, Jews and Gentiles. But in Christ, there's peace. Look at, uh, look at verse 14. It says, for he himself is our peace. Oh, let's back up to verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, which as Gentiles, we were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. There's so much about the law that says, separate yourself from the Gentiles. <laughs> separate yourself from the Samaritans and, and uh, the Hizzites and the Pezites and the Agites and all these other ites that we see in the Old Testament. And there is, there's a great separation for good reasons because those people worshiped idols and and God separated for himself a people that only worship him. So there was separation between Jews and Gentiles. Verse 13, we have been, uh, who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So in God's whole scheme of things, and this whole plan, is to bring together one body out of the two peoples, Jews and Gentile. Verse 14, for he himself, is our peace who was made who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation in verse 14 another way you can translate it and some translations say for he alone is our peace the only way to get brought into the blessings that god has for israel which include a new heavens and new earth which include being with God as he reigns for eternity over the earth. The only way to be a part of that is to be, uh, to be connected to the group whom the promises are given. And this is what this passage is saying. He has broken down the wall of separation, bringing the two groups together so that anybody who believes in Christ as that lamb of God slain for their personal sins, they've accepted Christ, can have a part of the blessings that God has for Israel. For he himself is our peace, verse 14 says, who alone, or who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. So while there was a very important separation that God's people would stay away from Gentiles, now God has broken down that wall, so we are essentially God's people. Now, it is not to say that the church and Israel are the same thing. Church and Israel are very separate, and there are certain uh, promises that, that Israel has that do not apply to the church. And there's a lot of Christian circles today that preach and teach that anytime you see Israel in the New Testament, that's actually talking about the church. You see Israel in Revelation, it's actually talking about the church. It's not. It's talking about Israel. There's, a, there's special blessings for Israel. There's a special amount of inheritance for the entire land that was promised to Israel to be theirs. Uh, we, we have in, in Revelation, uh, you have the, uh, the 12,000 from each of, of the 12 tribes of, of Israel. Those are specifically for J Israel. Those are Jews 
Jewish evangelists that spread the word uh, of, of God, of, of the word of Christ, the gospel. And that's not for uh, us. That's for them. There's special blessings for being a part of God's chosen people. But the entire blessing uh, of, of really essentially is God giving himself to mankind is given now to Jews and Gentiles. And we get to have a part of that and eventually have uh, the right to rule with Christ over the earth in the new heavens and new earth. So it says in verse 14, he himself is, is our peace. He alone is our peace. The only way we can have access to God, the only way we can have peace to God is through Christ alone, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. So there was two Jews, Gentiles, made one, thus making peace. And I want you to see here that this passage is very explicit when he uses the word enmity. Think of that word enmity. You know, if you have an en enemy, you have enmity between you and your enemy, right? It means that there is hatred there. And God if before you're saved, God hates sin. He hates sinners. We don't like talking about that in church. We like to say God loves the God hates the sin, but loves the sinner. Well, the Bible says that God hates the sinner. Who does He send to hell? He doesn't send the sin to hell. He sends a sinner to hell for the eternal wrath forever to be poured out on him. God hates sinners, and there is so much enmity when it, when you have a holy and perfect God. You and I, we have the ability to hate to an extent. But God, who's perfect in his holiness, can hate perfectly sin. Imagine that for a moment. We talk about how perfect God is. His hatred for sin is perfect. So that's what hell is. Hell is pouring God's hatred uh, of sin out for eternity. And if it was one day less than eternity, then God's hate wouldn't be perfect. And God wouldn't be perfect. He'd cease to be God. So in order for God to, to be God, his hatred has to be perfect. And there's so much enmity between who you used to be, who I used to be as an unsaved person, and a holy, perfect God. We forget how serious the holiness of God is. And he says there is enmity there. Verse 15, because of grace, because hatred was, isn't the only thing in God, of God's attributes, love is a big part of God's attributes, God is love. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh, Christ on the cross, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, God got rid of the enmity between sinful man and a holy God, granted you are a part of that group that has accepted Christ. And I like, I don't like talking about how holy God is and how, what perfect hatred of sin looks like, but it has to be a part of our understanding and our vocabulary because when you understand how holy God is, you understand how amazing grace is. You understand how great grace is. I mean, can you imagine hating somebody so much that you, you burn them with fire? You have a torch or something in your hand, you hate that person, so you burn them with fire. I mean, you or I probably don't have the capacity to do that as, as people that have love in our hearts, right? But God hates sinners so much with a perfect hatred that he sends them to hell forever and ever and ever. And that's what holiness is. Now, knowing that God hates sin that much, how great is it that he has abolished in his flesh the enmity between sinful man and a holy God. That Christ took all that wrath upon himself so that there is no hostility or enmity between sinful men who have accepted Christ and a holy God. If that doesn't make you appreciate grace, I don't know what will. Grace is the message. 
that a holy God has been disarmed in his hatred for you and for me. And it's all because of the lamb that was slain in fulfillment with the law. So that we're not in violation of any of the law, but we're still not bound by the law. We're still not suffering the consequences of our sin because Christ suffered the consequences of our sin for us so that we can be right with God, right with the law, and that God can have his amazing grace that glorifies himself shown through our lives. And that is awesome. That is cool. The gospel is a, is, is a two-part message. The gospel is, I am a wretched sinner, and Christ is an amazing Savior. There's two messages to the gospel. One, I am a wretched sinner, and two, Christ is an amazing Savior. And if we remember that, we remember how seriously God takes sin, how much God hates our sin. And when we see that Christ has set us free from that by taking the wrath on himself, it makes us love Christ more. It makes us appreciate Christ more. We who were afar off, God removed the middle wall of separation, abolished in his flesh the enmity so that sinful man can be made clean and be right with a holy God. Praise the Lord for the cross. Verse 16. That, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. So Jews and Gentiles can be one united. Granted that they're underneath the blood of the Lamb. This is talking about the church. Whether you're Jewish or whether you're Gentile, you have to be underneath the blood of the Lamb to be right with God. Jews that reject Christ are rejecting salvation. That he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, what separates us from God. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and those who were near. For through him we both have access to one spirit, to the Father. So peace is the theme of, uh, of verses 14 through uh, 18. Look at, look at verse 14. He himself, he alone is our peace who has made both one. And it's broken down the middle of all separation. Look at verse 17. He came and preached peace. So the, the, the theme of God's ministry to Gentiles is there is peace where there was not peace before. There is, there is love and before there was enmity. There is peace where there was no peace. And you think of the time before you knew Christ as your Lord and Savior. Before you accepted Christ, you had guilt for your sin. You had frustration, misery in your life. And if you accepted Christ and you obeyed Christ and you found strength and hope in Christ, it just, it just wasn't there. It just is there no longer. There's peace where there was not peace before. And this is why Christ came. The, the prayer that Christ prayed for his church before he died his prayer to, to God the Father was that the church be united, having peace the way that Christ and God the Father are united. God wants peace for his children. So all that has been done by Christ, all that has been done by God, going from the Old Testament through to the New Testament, has been to get to the point where there is peace, where there once was enmity. And that's what it means when we sing about amazing grace. We see how holy God is, how much God hates sin. And yet because of the cross, we have access to God, who is holy, perfectly holy. What do the angels in heaven sing about God? Holy, 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 day and night. That's God's, one of God's qualifying attributes is holiness. And that means his holiness is perfect and yet wretched sinners like you and like me can have access to God through the cross and through grace. Praise God for that. And, and it draws us close. 
When there's enmity, when enmity is released, when enmity is abolished, it brings closeness. I've had times with, with my kids, and uh, especially my, my son, who's 11, he's older, where he'll, he'll do something he shouldn't, and he'll, 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 he'll feel bad after, after his, his transgression is found out. And you know, maybe he'll, he'll, I don't want to get into specifics, because people go, oh, hey there, I heard you, you lying stole, oh boy, <laughs> I don't want to deal with that. But, you know, sometimes he'll, he'll break a rule, and he knows he's breaking a rule, and he do, does it on purpose, and he does it wholeheartedly, and, uh, you know, maybe he'll try to lie about it, and then, and then for a time, for an evening, or an hour, or a few minutes, there's enmity, as I, as I discovered this transgression, and he's sinned against me and the rules of my home, and, and, and I'm kind of letting him have it by lecturing him, and, and giving him the, the punishment or the consequences. So for a while, there's, there's something between him and his dad, right? There's, there's enmity there. But then after it's all is said and done and he's apologized, oh, I give him a hug and he cries. And, and then when enmity is gone, there's a closeness. I feel like when I, when, when I discipline my son and then afterwards I hug him and, you know, this hurts me more than it hurts you. And we're, we're hugging it out afterwards. There's a closeness there that was not there before, at least for a time, right? For a few moments. And so it's kind of like that. The, the enmity is keeping us away from God because of our, our sin, and we know how holy God is. But then when we're brought close, it's so sweet, isn't it? To know Christ, to rest in Christ, to have hope in Christ, that, that in the gospel we have peace and we have joy. Because the holiness of God has more or less been disarmed. In other words, there's no punishment anymore. It's all taken care of. The punishment is gone. You know, after you, uh, you, you, you spank your child, or if you're younger, if you remember when you were spanked, and then you hug it out, and it feels a little better, and, and there's tears, and you're, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I love you, I love you. There's, there's, a, there's a bond that's created when that hostility goes away, when that hostility is gone. And so you and I, we never really had to, never had to suffer the consequences of perfect holiness. We weren't under the law, having been punished by the law. We weren't uh, ever sent to hell. We only see the grace that's behind it. And I hope it draws you closer to Christ. I hope it, I hope it brings you closer to him. That's one of the, the purposes. It says that we, we're, we're drawn closer. Verse 17. Those who were once afar off have been brought near. Praise God for the fact that God did all the work to bring us near to himself. I hope you see that. I hope you appreciate it. 19 through 22 is kind of a, a theological statement about our citizenship. Verse 19 says... Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Have you ever been in a, in a secular place? And you can immediately tell who's, who's Christian, who's a believer, and who's just living for themselves and their own pleasures. I think that when you, when you get around Christians that you didn't know before, there's, a, there's an instant connection because their, their philosophy of life is quite different. And I started a, a position at, uh, at the dealership uh, in Makoka, and I, I can tell... I can tell the people that are just living for, for, for the lusts of their flesh and living for their base desires and, and they're miserable. Whereas the people that are Christians that are living for the Lord, they're happy and filled with joy. And there's, it's like, to me, it's night and day. You know, I've had, I've had one guy, oh, I probably shouldn't say this because it's going online. So I won't, I'll say that. Uh, Philippians 3 up on the screen talks about how we have citizenship in heaven. It says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. Paul writes to the church of Philippi. 
And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Keep your eyes on those who live for Christ. For as I have often told you before, now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Ever known anybody like that? They just live for their pleasures, the, 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 the pleasure of food or the pleasure of, of sensuality or their, their base desires. It says their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their, glo- and they, their glory is in their shame. People that, uh, that love to talk about all the, all the sin that they do and, you know, the, 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 the women that they've slept with are like victories to them, notches on their bedpost. Their glory is in their shame. They glory in what will bring them destruction, what will bring them shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship, the other side of, of the coin, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious bodies. So there is a, a, a distinction being made here in this passage in Philippians 3. That there are the, the, the believers and non-believers that live completely differently. One group glories in the return of Christ and, and in their relationship with Christ. They glory in their Savior. They're waiting for Christ to come back to change uh, to get them out of this the misery of, of, of a sin-cursed earth, they, their glory is in the cross. And there's this other group who is going to head to destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. You think of people who live for their base desires. They live for pleasures, greed, sex, food, they glory it. They live for it. There's a distinction here. One group is, is citizens of earth. The other group is citizens of heaven. In verse 20, it says, Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there. So this passage says in verse 19 of Ephesians uh, 2, it says, You are no longer strangers and foreigners. We're no longer afar off from God. And, and there was a certain way that foreigners were treated uh, according in, in the Old Testament times. If they wanted to convert, they convert to Judaism. That's great. Uh, but, but if they didn't want to convert, they were to be shunned. They, they, they worshipped idols or, or they, they lived for themselves and for their...